Facing a Real Dilemma The gospel that Peter and Paul and the other apostles preached was for everyone in the audiences they faced, wherever they went. It was not a message that only the elect could believe. Peter told Cornelius and his family and friends, And he, Christ, commanded us to preach unto the people, not to a select group, that whosoever among the people to whom he preached believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts chapter 10, verses 42 to 43. In contrast, Calvin's gospel says that Christ died, and his blood atones for only the elect. Could this be the same gospel Paul preached? Paul proclaimed to audiences, We declare unto all of you glad tidings. Acts 13, verse 32. The glad tidings of the gospel that Paul preached echoed what the angel of the Lord had said to the shepherds at the time of Christ's birth. I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Luke chapter 2 verse 10. These tidings of great joy concern the fact that the Savior of the world, Luke chapter 2 verse 11 and John chapter 4 verse 42, had been born. Calvin's gospel, however, says that Christ is not the Savior of the world, but only of the elect. How could that message be tidings of great joy to those whom the Savior did not come to save, and for whose sins he refused to die? Paul could and did honestly say to everyone he met, Christ died for you. In complete contrast, a book on biblical counseling that we have long recommended to readers declares, as a Reformed Christian, the writer, author, believes that counselors must not tell any unsaved counselee that Christ died for him, for they cannot say that. No man knows except Christ himself who are his elect for whom he died. The author calls himself a Reformed Christian. What might that mean? Obviously, Calvin's message of salvation for a select group does not bring great joy to all people. Palmer writes, But thank God that Christ's death was an absolute guarantee that every single one of the elect would be saved. So great joy comes to the elect alone. As for the rest, Calvin's doctrine that God had predestined their damnation could hardly be tidings of great joy. This is the way Calvin put it. To many, this seems a perplexing subject, because they deem it most incongruous that of the great body of mankind, some should be predestined to salvation and others to destruction. From this we infer that all who know not that they are the peculiar people of God must be wretched from perpetual trepidation. What gospel is this that is cause for joy to only some, it cannot be the biblical gospel that the angels announced. Because of the eternal importance of that question for the whole world to whom Christ commanded us to take the gospel, we are compelled to examine Calvinism closely in light of Scripture. Could it really be true, as Arthur C. Custance insists, that Calvinism is the gospel, and to teach Calvinism is in fact to preach the gospel? Is Calvinism founded upon the plain text of Scripture, or does it require interpreting common words and phrases such as all, all men, world, everyone that thirsteth, any man, and whosoever will, to mean the elect? Is a peculiar interpretation of Scripture required to sustain this doctrine? Our concern is for the defense of the character of the true God, the God of mercy and love, whose tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm 145, verse 9. The Bible declares that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4. Such is the God of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Open examination and discussion of important issues. 
especially the gospel and the very nature and character of God, can only be healthy for the body of Christ. It is my prayer that our investigation of Calvinism and its comparison with God's holy word, as expressed in the following pages, will bring helpful and needed clarification.